sure is down by a deadland side. I spied an old woman a plucking young nettles. She never saw me coming. I listened a while to the song she was humming. Glorio, Glorio, to the ball. They took me off the streets when I was lying rough out on the canal. It was very rough, very rough. And the old car, I could see. I went into that. I put my head down. And that was that. One certain party picked me up. Lizzie Pierce. God bless her. She got me on the canal one evening. I was ready to throw myself in. And she brought me um, up to the Simon. Yes, i never forget her. God bless her. I hope she's all right. Well, I worked in hospitals periodically, and then I got married. I married a waster. I have six children looking after themselves. Yeah. My family. God bless them. Don't mention them to me, because I don't want to mention them, though, because they're lovely. Yeah, my daughter is a nurse now in England. My three sons, one fella can speak seven languages. My Johnny, what do I do now? As I have the price of a bottle, I go out and I get it. A bad one, I have to sit in, read a book. I'm an awful old devil for reading. And let people know who the Simon are. They're great people. They are. I love them here. I do. We fight and we arg. Myself and the workers. Not other people. I fight and I arg with them many times. But still, they love me and I love them. Somewhere, my love. There will be songs to sing Somewhere, my love Whenever you are near You'll go to me And father lift the fire See that I know I love you as a more. Six years ago, that woman had nothing to sing about. Her home was a bundle of damp papers on the banks of a canal. She was a homeless, penniless alcoholic with no one to care for her. She was typical of the down and out who live on Skid Row and who are cared for by the Simon community. Anton Wallach Clifford is the founder of Simon. Skid Row, geographically, in the most accepted descriptive term would be the, the sensational Skid Row of America, the wrong side of the tracks, the east side of a town, where the winos, the addicts lie out in gutters, where rubbernecks, you know, the people who want to look at them are taken round by buses, uh, and people say that is Skid Row. But I personally use the term, and the term itself is acceptable today, as meaning the bottom end of our social strata one doesn't necessarily have to go right to the bottom. One may end up, in fact, in what I would call the fringe of Skid Row, that is Bedsitter Land, the loneliness of Bedsitter Land. But that, for me, is the beginning of Skid Row. Skid Row itself is the very bottom end of our social strata. It is a sump of, of human unhappiness, misery and degradation. And it is peopled by hundreds, thousands, because we're talking in terms of a global problem, thousands of men and women who once had a life. They once had a today, but as far as they're concerned, now there is nothing left at all, only an expectation of death. Well, why do you think these people ended up on Skid Row? For each individual, one has to trace back why, for that particular man, for that particular woman, there came a point when 
the will to go on broke finally and they ended up on a very slippery slope now it's the easiest thing to slide into skid row it's the hardest thing to climb out again and this is why i'm always saying that the problem is increasing it's getting bigger the society we are creating around us today this competitive rat racing society is in fact creating an even bigger skid row because there are so many of us in fact who for a variety of reasons a whole variety of reasons are unable to compete unable to keep up with the joneses unable to to maintain the constant pressure and tension of, of, of living in the society and so we begin to let things slide once we begin not to keep up disciplines in our own life not to keep up a job not to keep up with our family ties then we are on the first steps to that slippery slope down and from then onwards it's a very easy thing to slip down could you detail some of the factors that lead a person to skid row uh without any doubt at all uh alcoholism is, is the greatest single cause of those who end up on skid row the drinker the the vagrant drinker would make up the greater part of our skid row world then closely followed behind the drinker is just the can't coper the man or woman who can no longer cope with life as it is and ends up in dot houses flop houses all-night cafes or rough sleeping in parks and gardens with the intention of tomorrow i'll get a job tomorrow i will be able to do something but in fact tomorrow never comes following behind the alcoholic the addict the can't coper you get those who have a, a, a whole series of sexual problems the homosexual the lesbian what we call the flasher the indecent exposure and those who have promiscuous relationships but but for whom in fact sexual aberration is a causal factor in their inability to cope with life then one has to also remember that in in skid row or one is going to find those uh, who are what we call recidivist prisoners and recidivist mental hospital patients men and women who as a result of being constantly imprisoned have become prison prone they are more at home in prison than they are in normal society and they are on that unhappy circuit of prison to what when they come out a dos house a large impersonal hostel what's the real difference in the end it doesn't really matter you might just as well go back to prison and so we find and certainly this is very true in britain that say a third of our prison population is made up of men and women who are homeless on release which is why one needs to concentrate very much these days on aftercare facilities for the homeless and rootless prisoner is there any major difference between a man on skid row and a woman on skid row no not really numerically of course there is i mean there are fewer women in skid row than men although again there is an increase in women dropping out and noticeably so in terms of the woman alcoholic 12 years ago one in 20 20 alcoholic you know, a group of alcoholics would be a woman then over the years it got to one in eight now it's down to one in four there is a there's a, there's a definite increase in female alcoholism which means that there is an increase therefore in the women who drop out and end up in skid row and therefore uh, an added need for a special care for women and the setting up of projects to deal with the women are the majority of people on skid row uneducated unskilled people certainly not skid row is made up of every kind of individual man and woman from every background you will find on skid row certainly the man who, who has done no more than dig a trench and probably dug a very good trench in his time but you'll find the deckhand and the ship's captain you'll find an army officer and a private you'll find the doctor the teacher and you'll find the priest what sort of lives do these people live on skid row they don't live they exist well, what do they do all day long it's an endless round of where do i sleep tonight how can i con some money for a bottle how can i get my drugs how can i get some money to to buy a cheese roll to buy a, a coffee at some store to avoid that threat of a tap on the shoulder are the fuzz are the police after me am i going to be warned on again to keep moving can you describe some typical skid row scenes cold loneliness isolation back streets deserted parks and gardens lonely railway stations which were busy by day 
stay open at night for late night trains and yet house men and women who fitfully sleep cold, huddled up on benches, very often disturbed by the railway police, constantly moving them on. They shuffle away, they come back, they sit down again, try perhaps for another hour or two to snatch some sleep. Maybe they hang around some coffee stall with a few pennies they've begged, trying to get warmth from a cup of coffee. Out in the parks and gardens you find under bushes the man or woman huddled up, knees up to chin, an old coat hauled over for warmth, nothing but the bare earth and the damp around. Down on the ramps, the own, what we call ramps, those are the open sites, the demolition sites, bomb sites, with broken bricks and glass and rubble and just a burning campfire made up of old crates, torn down hoardings, anything at all to give warmth and security and light. Men and women huddled round, passing a bottle. Their only consolation is in the bottle. The one thing that binds them together is the bottle. Existing only for the bottle, sharing the bottle, and finding that perhaps that's the only reason that they can go on even for one night longer. What do people on Skid Row think about? Where do I get the next bottle? Where do I get the next drug? Where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to do tomorrow? Is anyone going to pick me up? Am I going to get arrested? Those on Skid Row tend to gather together. Yes. There are the loners. They move away. They tend to, to find isolated parks or isolated parts of stations. But your, your vagrant drinkers tend to congregate together. I think perhaps one of the most appalling indictments of our society today is in the great metropolitan city of London itself where every night under the railway arches at Charing Cross we have Cardboard City. Cardboard City so called because there you see on the two pavements either side of that small road lines and lines of cardboard boxes newspapers, plastic sacks, and each little pile of boxes and each plastic sack under each pile of papers is a human being, a man or woman. And I would say 50% of those down there are Irish, men and women. And they have nothing but the pavement for a bed and the cardboard boxes for warmth. How much dignity can a man have in that sort of situation? I think it's absolutely fantastic that once you have shown love, tenderness and compassion, a man's dignity is restored. When he's out there, alone, or in a group, and knows that he's only existing, and knows how you look at him, smoke-blackened face, filthy clothing, torn and tattered, bleeding, dirty, evil-smelling, he lacks all human dignity. He's a caricature of a human being. But if you can look at him and see in his face, the face of a suffering Christ, and offer him love and accept him and put your arms round him and say, come on, son, drink this up. It's good for you. Or come on into this van, we'll take you home. You can see a man's eyes light up. You can see the shoulders go back. There is an acceptance, a return of dignity. How difficult is it for people to get off Skid Row? Very difficult indeed. It's the easiest thing to get into. It's the hardest thing to get out. You can't get out on your own. Once you're down, you're stuck. That's why we're so desperately needed. We need all the help we can if we are ourselves to lead with people, not take them forcefully, but to lead them, to assist themselves in moving away from that situation into something which they can create for themselves. Anton Wallach Clifford had a normal British middle-class upbringing. He first became interested in the problems of the homeless when, as a child, his mother insisted that he carry a few pence in his pocket to give to the poor. For a time he wanted to become a priest, but when the war came, he left the seminary and joined the Royal Air Force. After the war, he was a freelance journalist, but soon drifted back into social work, first as a teacher in an approved school, and later as a probation officer. It was here that he became aware of the people who had no homes. 
people of no fixed abode. Frustrated by the lack of facilities for these people, he founded the Simon Community. As a probation officer, I, I had been very concerned increasingly with the problems of the homeless offender. This, this had been brought home to me very clearly in my work in the approved school. Uh, and I had wanted to get to Bow Street where I knew uh, there was the greatest turnover of what we call the NFA offenders for no fixed abode offenders. When I got to Bow Street, uh, I was able, in fact, to specialise in the care of the homeless. This, this became my special task. And dealing every day in court with those who were NFA of no fixed abode, I felt that I had to know far more about their way of life, far more about their background, and also myself become much better known in their world if I was to do the job properly. I, I went on what I called my night skipper, which meant that I was a probation officer by day and a bum by night. Uh, I used to keep what I called my fading gear, that's a tatty raincoat, some old trousers and a jacket, in, in my office. And on those nights when I knew I was going to do this, at the end of the day, I changed into my fading gear, I went down to the main line station, down to the all-night caffs, and I, I, I was as assisted in this by young homeless people who had been on probation to me and with whom I, I had a, an established a really good relationship. And they acted as my guides and mentors. No one down there knew I was a probation officer. I was just another guy looking for somewhere to kip that night, looking for somewhere to sleep or looking for somewhere to get a cup of coffee. And so I drifted around the stations, around the all-night cafes, around the back streets, and then gradually over a period of months, I got lower and lower, so that in the end, uh, I would be spending nights out with the meth-drinking schools on the ramps. Were you actually drinking meth? Oh, yes. I mean, it, it, not, not to begin with, because in the dark, and uh, just the flickering shadows of a campfire, and the men and the women singing, shouting, talking, and I was just Kent Tony. The bottle would pass, and they'd say, oh, pass him the bottle, pass him the bottle, and I would take the bottle, and then I would just hold it up and pass it to the next guy. But later on, after I had started Simon, after I still had to go down and get deeper still into this world, if, if it was to be a, a true community of misfits, then, because I had established relationships um, with these guys whilst I was a probation officer, I, I was with them in their dairy buildings, their derelict buildings. There was candlelight, and I could be seen. Now, it seemed to me that if I had come in my old jacket and a cap and was sitting there with some sandwiches and offered them sandwiches. They had nothing else in the world to offer me but meth. I had to take that meth, and I did take meth, certainly. Did you like living on Skid Row? No, of course not, because, I mean, I, I, I was experiencing, albeit in such short periods, the absolute horror of feeling that you were, in fact, outside society, that you were looked down upon, I could begin to understand then why you, be, you, you start off thinking that society rejects you and why you end up rejecting society. And this was what I was learning. This was a hard lesson. And I, I mean, I don't like sitting out or lying out on a pea-ridden mattress which stinks and with the lice jumping around. I don't like the rats crawling over me. I don't like having to crawl through to help the guy maybe who's got a burnt leg or, or you know, is bleeding from some scar it's got torn open in the night, helping him crawl through the bushes to get some more wood to keep the fire going. But these are the things we had to do. And it's not pleasant, but it's something that one had to do. And I, and I, I believe that for, for me, this was a very, very necessary part of my education. And it's the only way in which I could then become effectively an ambassador for those who can't speak for themselves. We are called Simon after the unknown citizen, that man about whom we know so little, who assisted Christ to carry his cross, and that's all we're attempting to do. We can't carry the individual cross of every man and woman who comes into our, into our houses, but we can be there to put a shoulder under that cross. We can be there to assist in some way. And uh, I'm personally very conscious that um, in, in, in trying to follow Simon, we, we are in fact following a way of the cross. But I think personally we are living out the gospel message, although, and I must make this clear, we are dealing with men and women of all faith and none, and our workers are all faith and none. Now, whether in Irish Simon you have Irish workers mixed up with American workers or workers from abroad, so in Britain you are just as likely to find the Jew and the Arab and the Frenchman and the, and the German 
working together in a house with, 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 with English and Irish. We, we are very international. In every country in the world there are homeless and rootless people, people who are on the very bottom rung of the social ladder. They are people who cannot adjust to the world around them. They are alcoholics, drug addicts, homosexuals, schizophrenics, people on the way out of prison, and those who simply cannot cope with life. All are inadequate, yet all need love, acceptance and care. The Simon community aims to do precisely that. Anton Wallach Clifford. Well, we started in 1963, just my mother, a discharged prisoner and an ex-mental hospital patient and myself. Uh, I had a flat for my mother. We turned that into a community home. We had a common way of life. We prayed together. We worked together. We certainly couldn't take anybody in there. We aimed to get a house as quickly as we could to set up our caring community. But for a whole variety of reasons, pressures of the neighbours and the rest of it, the house we first sighted uh, wasn't available. There were public outcries, attempts to, to stop us getting hold of this property, and we had to give up that, that idea up. And so for seven months, uh, we found ourselves campaigning the cause. And so we established very rapidly through the media the idea of Simon. We did attract a lot of publicity, and I'm a great believer in using publicity in our cause. And so we, we, we used radio, TV, and the newspapers to put over the message of Skid Row. And then on Palm Sunday, 1964, we took over Trafalgar Square for the first national rally for the homeless. And from that moment onwards, there hasn't been any turning back because as a result of that rally, we were offered a house in London. We took it over. We opened our first Simon Caring House in St. Joseph's House in Kentish Town, London. And within months, we had opened up in Rochester and we'd opened up a farm in Kent. And we, we then spread over the next few years. We spread throughout um, England into Scotland and in 1969, of course, we came to Ireland. Did you find it difficult to set up Simon in Ireland? I originally came here with three other members of our community in January 1969 out of sheer desperation. There are so many vagrant Irish drinkers in Skid Row. 27% of all vagrant drinkers in, 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 in England are Irish, 26 are, uh, are Scottish, and the rest made up of other nationalities and I wasn't getting any Irish workers. And I came over to Ireland to appeal for help from the Irish with our work in Britain. And at the end of a week's touring, I got back to Dublin, and a group of students approached me and said, not only are we prepared to help you, but we are going to have Simon in Ireland, and we are going to have a soup run. And that was in January. And when we came back in May, the, uh, the Dublin soup run was already set up, and the group in Limerick already had a property which they wanted me to look at to see if it was suitable to set up a Simon community in Limerick. And in fact, I, I, I found such tremendous enthusiasm in Ireland that ever since then, I've always said I come over here to recharge my batteries. Simon found a natural home in Ireland. There are Simon houses in Dublin, Dundalk, Belfast, Limerick and Cork, and each house helps the down and out in their area. In each house, dropouts and Simon workers live together in community. The dropouts are free to come and go as they wish, but they can eat, sleep and live there. Simon relies on voluntary subscriptions, though in Ireland it receives grants from the various health boards. Simon workers don't get any wages, just pocket money. In England they get £3.50 per week, while those in Ireland get £5. To be a Simon worker, you must be at least 18. After your application is received, you are interviewed and screened. If you're accepted, you are then trained by established Simon workers. Because each Simon house is a community, the workers live with those they're helping. What effect does this have on workers? Very dramatic at times. I have yet to find any former worker of Simon who won't say, Simon has changed me, no matter how short his experience in Simon was. I don't think you can come and serve in Simon and be unchanged. I like to think that the real value of the worker is not just in the six, nine or twelve month service he gives us, but it is in the fact that when he or she returns to normal society, they are basically going to be the leavening influence which will bring about a real caring community. I think they are going to be better husbands and wives, better doctors and priests, better teachers, uh, and 
better citizens and better voters as a result of his experience. Simon's aim is to help social dropouts. Yes. Do you find that some people just refuse to be helped? If you mean that when you're out on a soup run and you see someone that you could actually take home and you go up and you say, uh, you know, come home with us tonight, they're not going to rush up and say, oh, God bless you, thank you very much, jump in the van and go home. They might very well tell you exactly what you can do with yourself and where you can put yourself. Um, you don't give up then and say he doesn't want to be helped. You've got to understand why a person reacts in this way. In the same way that when you're doling out soup, uh, a person in drink may well throw the soup back in your face, and you can't, you know, you can't worry about that. You know, people seem sometimes to feel that when we do this kind of work, we ought to expect gratitude. Now, it's the last thing we should expect. We have got to accept people on their terms as they are. We've got to see them as they are. You know, I don't want to glamorise anything that I've said about Skid Row. We must de-glamorise Skid Row. They are not lovely people. They're very ugly people, they're very smelly people, they're very evil-tempered people, they're very foul-mouthed people, uh, and, and certainly they will give often every indication that the last thing they want is help, and yet one has got to see through that, read through that, and have tremendous patience and keep chipping away, because basically what they want to do is, with independence, to help themselves, and this is what we have got to enable them to do. And even when we're running a house, it's not a bed of roses. You are still going to have those who are going to leave you for a time. They're going to have a row with you. They're going to say, I don't want to know you anymore, and they'll go away. But the great thing is they so often come back, and we must have an ever-open door. We must be ready to receive them back. There are three types of Simon houses. The first is known as the wet shelter. It's a place where the homeless alcoholics can come and stay while continuing to drink. No pressure is put on them to stop drinking, but those who want help will get it. The second type of Simon House is known as a dry house. It's designed to help people back into society and usually has a small community of workers and dropouts who are gradually overcoming their problems. The third type of house is for people who have come up through the other two and who are in need of a permanent home. They may have full-time employment if they're able to work and Simon gives them a home and roots in society. What type of rules do they have in Simon Houses? The basic rules to all Simon Houses, other than a wet shelter, and they are exceptions, you know, not every community has a wet shelter, that is, a place where people can bring a bottle in. The normal rules are no bottles, no violence, and no drugs. After that, the conventions of a house are those established by the group. The house is run by the workers and residents meeting together every morning and discussing yesterday, today, the plans of today, who's going to do what, whose particular task it is to wash up, to sweep, to clean, to man the shop, to do the shopping, to do all these kind of things. These have to be agreed mutually, and therefore each community will make its own rules as it goes along. But we are not like hostels that have large notices, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt do that. This is what we avoid. We do things through group. You spend much of your time visiting schools and talking to young oh, yes. people. What do you tell them? I try effectively, dramatically if you like, to bring out the full impact of homelessness and rootlessness in Skid Row terms. The kind of men and women who live down there, what it means to be down there, the loneliness, the horror, the degradation, and then try to get across to young people. The first of all, they've got to have compassion and understanding. If they have compassion and understanding, then they've got to ask themselves, what am I going to do about it? Am I in any way responsible for this? Is my family, is my town, my society in any way responsible? What would I want to do to assist? And I think that I've got to try and get across to young people that without young people, our communities can't exist. We need them primarily as workers. Do you find that young people do care? Well, I mean, the community could not have gone on now for 12 years and spread throughout England, Scotland, Ireland, uh, North and South, uh, and into Africa, if it wasn't for the continual stream of young people who have come in so willingly, happily, to offer their terms of service. It is not the older people who are able to do this, it's young people who can afford the time, who have this tremendous spirit, and it's young people above all, who have a tremendous empathy with the non-citizen. And one of the reasons for that is that young people themselves, so often said to be in a state of rebellion, are in fact questioning society. They're questioning values, and they can understand very realistically 
why your dropout drops out. Therefore, there's a natural empathy, and I, I rely entirely on young people. Do you find that their parents sometimes object to their yes. sons and daughters mixing with alcoholics and junkies and those who are on skid row? I find very often that there's an initial hostility and rejection, and then so often we find that it's the parents of workers who in fact send clothing and donations. <laughs> What practical things can teenagers do while they're still at school to help down the nuts? While they're still at school, I mean, the, the, the most important thing is to get together and set up a Simon group, a uh, young Simon, we call it, to set up a young Simon group to adopt the nearest Simon community. Once they've done that, there are so many practical things they can do. I mean, to begin with, as a group in school, uh, they, they can start a project on the homeless and rootless, getting cuttings from newspapers, magazines, uh, researching the problem for themselves, studying it, getting to know more about it, writing about it, and then when they've done that and have attempted to adopt some community, uh, they can find out what are the needs of that community. Obviously clothing. There's always a need for constant supply of clothing, food. Now one of the great things that you can do in school is at either the beginning or end of every term to go to your mum and say, I just want one jar of jam or one packet of sugar or one can of beans and take that back to school. Now, when you've got a large school and every pupil brings back just one tin can or packet and puts that together, you've got a tremendous hamper that will keep your community going without spending its hard-earned cash, possibly for a month. What about a place which has no Simon community? What can the teenagers well, in that area do? Well, I mean, first of all, they could find out, is, is there, in fact, any, any kind of organisation working with the homeless and rootless? I mean, is there a local SVP or, or, or Legion of Mary uh, hostel there? Do they need practical help and get them involved in that way? Let them start being co-workers and helpers to that group. If there's nothing at all, then certainly the young people might be the, the initial group to set up with adults, a co-worker group which would set about setting up a project in the town or city. Well, if a group wished to set up a local Simon yes. Centre, what would they do? Well, if it's done in school, I would certainly suggest the first thing to do is, is, is to, to, to have a project in the school, either as one class or a group you know, comprising people from different classes, so that by um, going through all the magazines and papers that they come across, books, collecting books, and this sort of thing, I mean, I already know of schools where, where, where this is done, and their the classrooms are lined with, with pictures from magazines and papers, and they've collected all the books that are published about this kind of problem, they read them, and then they begin themselves to write essays about it, so they really get themselves into the subject. Now, the next step then, and this would require a rather older group, uh, is, is to do a survey in the town or city, which means taking three nights, preferably in colder weather, uh, and going out at night from midnight onwards, say from midnight till four or five in the morning, going around the stations, the back streets, the cafes, the waterfront, the parks and the gardens, looking for rough sleepers, looking for those who are wandering about, assessing the size of the problem in that town, and by day, making inquiries of all the existing agencies. Get hold of the, the local health board, get hold of a local hospital, get hold of a local prison. How many people are discharged from prison homeless? How many people leave, leave hospital homeless? Where do they go? Find out from the Legion of Mary and, and, and the um, SVP. You know, uh, how, many, how many do they have in normally? How many do they turn away? Uh, do they believe there is a need for this kind of project to exist? Research the whole thing very thoroughly. Then if you come up with the idea that there is a very real need in that area to set up our kind of grassroots, caring, community group, uh, then you've got to have a public meeting, which means you've got to get together with the parents, the PTA maybe, Parent Teacher Association, possibly some representatives of trade unions who certainly want the, the, the local churches involved, hold a public meeting, put over, this is the problem in our town, this is what we need to do, to do it we must have property, now what help are we going to get? We want to form up a committee who will be prepared to raise the money voluntarily to either rent or buy some cheap, preferably near derelict type of property, and it must be sited in an area where it will be inoffensive, out of the way of your good residential areas, you must cite these places properly. Too many mistakes are made by, by going entirely to the wrong area. Because, I mean, that offends not only the people who live there, but also it's too grand for the people who are going to come into our kind of community. So you've got to get the right area, get your property, and then, uh, when you really feel that you're getting somewhere like that, it's certainly in the meantime you should have got in touch, if you're in Ireland, with uh, Simon Ireland, which is the coordinating body of all the Simon communities in Ireland, 
This is based in Dublin. Uh, now, in England, they'd get, they'd get in touch with um, John James at 118 Grove Green Road, Leighton East 11, and he would then provide them with all the information available about Simon, advise the, the books that they should read, and assist them in, in setting up a project, because uh, in, inevitably, one or other of the existing Simon communities would be asked to second someone to go down there and help them set it up. And this is what, in fact, would happen in England or Ireland. On the other hand, as many of the projects these days are totally independent of umbrella organisations, both in Ireland and in England, they may not want, in fact, to get in touch with a body, but may want to do this entirely on your own. And there's no reason why you shouldn't. Now, at that stage, you will also have to decide whether, in fact, you're going to get grant in aid or whether you're going to finance this entirely voluntarily. Where would you go for a grant? In Ireland, you'd go to your local health board. you certainly go to your government agencies. Uh, and in, in Britain, you would go to the Department of Health and Social Security, as it's called, and put to them the problem, your intentions, and ask what, what grant and aid they're prepared to make to you. Also, you then go to various charitable foundations, which exist uh, in both in, in, in Ireland and, and in England, and, and ask for help from them too. You go to the large firms and breweries, the bodies like this, and, and ask them for help in setting up a project. Once you are, uh, you are in touch with Simon, you'll certainly get assistance with your workers. You'll, you'll have workers sent to you. If you go independent, then you'll have to set up your own scheme for recruiting and training your workers, which is why I would certainly advise any group setting up such a, a project today to get in touch with uh, an, an established Simon, Simon body, certainly, or in England, with either the Simon community or the Cyrenians. What about a group of teenagers in an area where they don't want to buy a house or to rent mm -hmm. a house, what else can they do? If they set up uh, a young Simon group in a school, then they can adopt the nearest Simon community. Now, this may be uh, anything up to 100 miles away. That doesn't, that doesn't matter at all. Distance is immaterial. For example, uh, a, a school in Mill Street has adopted the Cork Simon community, and another school in Nina has adopted the Limerick Simon community. Now, what they're doing, in fact, is making certain each term they collect at least one hamper of food, they're continually collecting clothing, and the pupils themselves have arranged their own collection days. Uh, in Nina, they, they took a caravan on the streets and fasted for three days, uh, raising money for local charities and also for the community, with the result that they were able to give £135 to, to the Limerick community. Now, these are all the kind of activities which the young people can take on while they're still at school. And I think this is terribly important that they should get involved and find that they can do practical things uh, whilst they're still at school. And then when they leave school, they can continue that. Well, then, then, then hopefully when they leave school, uh, you know, we are going to rely on at least a few of them coming to us full-time as workers, others as co-workers, and certainly if pupils are going on to, to, to university, then they can get tied up with a, with a group or start a group if one doesn't exist in their university where, again, students become very active co-workers and are also very often responsible for undertaking surveys and setting up new groups. If you're interested in helping the Down and Out, you can contact the Simon community for help and information at Simon Ireland, Milltown Road, Dublin 6. I firmly believe that we have to establish a truly caring community if we are, in fact, to be worthy of ourselves as human beings. We cannot neglect our brother. We are our brother's keeper. It is not enough to say, the state takes care of this, I don't have to bother. I think it's very important that each and every one of us, no matter what our age, no matter what our background, no matter what our condition, is that we should be concerned about the guy next door, about the person who's sleeping out, about the homeless and rootless.